everybody. Today we're in a Wakota Hatchie wetlands to film our virtual hike. Now the first interesting bit of information is Wakota Hatchie wetlands is not a natural wetland. It is a man-made wetland. It is associated with the Palm Beach County Water Utilities Department where the wastewater is treated and when it is mostly treated and still has some remaining nutrients it gets pumped into this site. So approximately 1 million gallons of water every day is pumped back into the site and because so much water is pumped into this area you can imagine that it stays wet all year round and this acts as a slough which is just a natural depression in the water that or the ground that tends to retain water year round. Um, and because it's wet all year, the water that is percolates back into the Florida table, the aquifer, and that actually recharges our drinking water, which is really important due to the quantity of people in Florida, because it is the third most populous state. Our aquifers have become mostly depleted, but because of the water that this man-made wetland brings back in, it will recharge and that kind of helps negate this issue. Um, and because it is wet year, all year round, it's a really attractive spot for the northern migrating songbirds that come down here. So here we have a group of mosquito fish. They are very important forage fish, which they make great, bird, <coughs> great prey items for a bird's prey. So common moorhens are the most common water bird here. They sound like a stereotypical monkey car if you ever hear them and they have yellow legs and they are herbivorous. All right, so the plant we have here is called pickerel weed and it's got this very beautiful purple inflorescent flower on these like elongated leaves. They are an indicator of good water quality and they also are a huge nectar source for different pollinator species like butterflies and bees. So over here on our left, we have the invasive green iguana. Now, despite their commonality seen here in Florida, they are not natives. They, like many others, were released from the pet trade. They're pretty big, uh, but they are herbivorous, so they won't be, you know, eating anything other than vegetation. Also out here, we have the anhinga. Now, it's one of our most common diving birds. They actually have less wax in their feathers so that they can actually dive and get into the water and they use that sharp pointy beak as a spear to spear any fish that they encounter. Now they do have sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. The females should on their breast be like a lighter brown while the males are all black. Is a green heron. They are very smart. They fish um, in the water, they use insects and drop them in the water as bait to lure fish. And that's their method of catching fish. Um, despite their size and appearance, currently, they have really long necks. So, a lot of these are like pond apple trees. And these little islands in the water act as like rookeries for the different migrating northern birds and songbirds and our traditional like year-round wading and diving birds. The large luckeries are often in the spring so in the fall and winter there's usually migrating birds instead of the luckeries. So yep, we got more pond apples here and there. And pond apples actually do produce an edible fruit Um, but they are rare plants because of the habitat, habitat destruction of wetlands. Okay, so what we're seeing here is fire flag, also known as alligator flag. It is an indicator of deep water parts um, because alligators like to make depressions. Um, it's identified by its purple and red flower, hence the name Violet Flag. Although it's not budding at this time. 
So what we're seeing here is water lettuce. They can get really large, although these ones are quite small, and they form large mats of them that shade out everything. They are an invasive species. They're a very common turtle species. Yeah, we got the Florida cooter right here. Identified by the yellow stripes. Yeah. On his, what, face? Well, here we have the largest wading bird, the great blue heron. It has a variety of diets due to its size, so it's anything it can visit its mouth, including yep. snakes, amphibian, and even juvenile alligators. Yes, yeah, so watch out. They're also ambush predators, and like the Anhinga, will use their sharp beak to pierce whatever they're aiming at. So in here, we have the Asiatic Swamp Hen, another invasive uh, organism here. They look kind of similar to the purple galano with their like iridescent feathers, but they also have a really wide beak in comparison and that like full red frontal shield. And you can tell because um, they have red legs instead of the yellow ones. Like the yeah. oh. and and there's an another one over there. Moorhen. Oh, there's a moorhen? Uh, straight back. Straight. Oh, and a moorhen. He right there. That guy. Got an eastern gray squirrel right here. Oh, right there. You really do be though. We got our friend here still. He really is posing. Yep, here's some larger of the alligator flag. Some of it's drying out. Here's a better video footage of the female moorhen here. You can tell that she's much more drab in color. It's probably what's making the other male moorhens fight. So some green iguanas do have that orangish coloration on them. I think that just is a representation of, like, maturity. But he's sitting all the way back there. <laughs> we got a double-crested cormorant right here. That one in the far back that you were seeing is not an Inhinga. It's got that hooked beak. So that's a double-crested cormorant. It's our second most common weight, uh, diving bird here. And it, in a similar fashion, it uses that beak to just latch on and don't let go of like fish. Same situation with the lack of wax in their feathers. So here we have the American alligator. Oh. So, the Florida State Reptile is the American Alligator. American Alligators were endangered for a very long time, but conservation efforts really, really pulled them out, and they've actually mostly rebounded. They are an important or keystone species due to their alligator holes, which service as like a water pool during the dry season, where there's still water available. Uh, and the e one of the easiest and like simplest and fastest ways to tell the difference between an alligator or a crocodile is while coloration is not perfect, they're usually darker than crocodiles. They have a very wide snout in comparison, U-shape, not V. And their top row of teeth is the only thing that's showing when their mouths are closed, instead of both the top and bottom like a crocodile. Handsome. Got another in Hinga. I think that's a female because of the brown neck. Probably drying out her feathers. But right here, we've got a tricolor heron. They are, as their name implies, multicolored. 
they have a greenish leg color. Uh, There's purple on the back, white on the breast, and red and black streaks along the breast. And they're one of the most common ones. <laughs> yep. I wish he would gently turn around for us to see some of those extra colors, but all you can see right now are his little legs and that purple brown gray black back. Got another great blue heron back there. Some more pond apple, pickerel weed. I believe what we're looking at, while it might look similar to the back of the tricolor, is I believe a little blue because it had, when it was flying over, no additional color. It was just one solid color. And maybe if he turns, you'll see. Um, yeah, little blue hands are often very dark. They have light green or gray legs. They're, they have a light black beak with the black tip on it. Which I think you can see in this. Oh, yep, he turned. There we go. Very small, as the name implies. And the juveniles are surprisingly white. Beak color stays the same. Mm -hmm. But just white. That's definitely a little blue. We got another Florida cooter here, much bigger than the other one we saw. Distinct yellow bar stripes again on the head, but you can also see his really, hopefully, really distinct coloration on his shell. <music> saw quite a while ago from the other angle but now we got this guy on this angle a little closer so what was hiding in this pond apple tree on this little island is actually a cattle egret much smaller than the gray egret which is why we know it's definitely not that guy they have an all yellow leg and foot and they have a yellow beak as well Yep, that's how you use that, the a whole yellow leg and foot to tell the difference between cattle and snowies, because I believe snowies should have black feet. Snowies have black legs and yellow feet. Yeah, I had it in reverse. <laughs> And down there is the alligator. <laughs> so as we move from the wetland into the wetland, Kodahatchee is actually made up of a couple different um, habitats. We will see a small change from all the pond apples to some wax myrtle and some cypresses. And here in Kodahatchee, there are two types, the pond and bald cypress. We'll talk about the differences and how to tell the difference between each. I believe what's right ahead of us is a wax myrtle tree. And you can look at them and know that it's wax myrtle because they produce a cluster of fruit that develop along their branch. In addition, they're pretty waxy and they're actually used in like candles and potpourri. But they're also used as the larval host plant for the red banded hair streak butterfly. So they're pretty important tree. Here in Lakota, we've now entered a small live oak, a corrugated bark, oak hammock. And as we talked about in our previous video, usually these locations don't get a lot of water. And especially here in Lakota Hatchie, it's kind of this little strip, but also in these little strips is where we get to see most of our mammal population here. Sometimes you can see raccoons, gray squirrels, which we saw but didn't get a chance to get on video, and the elusive marsh rabbit often hot spots these little locations. Yeah, because they like to hang in dry areas like small areas. So we'll keep an eye out and see if we can't maybe find one. And say there is an iguana all the way back in that sun. Yep, their little heads bobbing out right there. But yeah. So this is another area where 
it's highly populated during the breeding season in the spring. Uh, almost can never hear yourself think because of the amount of bird calls you hear. All the way in the back, got some great blue heron. I think some more hens were calling. But as you can tell, as we've moving, we've moved into the dry season. It's pretty empty. We've got some alligator flag. The common dragonflies you'll see here are either roseate skimmers or green darners. And dragonflies are very helpful. If you see them flying around you, they won't bite. They don't bite people. They're probably trying to eat the mosquitoes or other small insects that are actually around you. Some more. Ooh, I believe spatter duck. So. I believe because these have the elongate heart-shaped lily pads, I believe this should be spatter dock. And especially when they're blooming, they have that very distinct yellow bud. And that's what, especially when you know you're dealing with spatter dock. Yeah, and there's some more water lettuce. So you can yeah. see the impact You can actually of it see that's what a spatter dock flower looks like. We've got those pond apple islands out there. The little swivels. Uh, so yes, here you can especially see the water lettuce mat making those mats. So what we're looking at here is leather farm. It is a leather farm species and we can tell it is leather farm because the underside is covered in spores, which gives it that leathery look and feel. Green heron, and you said, oh, I see it now. Let me see. There's a turtle there and a moorhen hanging out right there. They're all just sunbathing, hanging out, sunny. Now we're moving into another little hammock, another little upland habitat. Again, hot spot for your mammals, so maybe if we turn. No, nope, no marsh rabbits out here today. Not yet, at least, you never know. But. Look at that. Cabbage palm, Florida state tree. It's a monocot, like your grass. We have a juvenile black crowned night heron. And then, wood storks. And like the endangered species list because they were also hunted extensively for their plumage. Um, but they, this is a hot spot for their rookeries in the spring. Usually the ones dominating most of the, uh, the pond apple islands. You can also tell they're wood storks, although maybe my camera won't look at them. They got those white bodies, really long blackish legs, and their neck and head are usually naked and just like black. And they got those long curved beaks too. Try color right there more of the pickerel weed. So that right there is a spotted tilapia, which you can tell based off its bars, although this video might not. Underneath, I think we got some blue tilapia. There probably is like, but yeah, you can just see they're all kind of gathered here as the dry season comes on and the water gets low where they have less places to go and hide. So we've got some glossy ibises here. They are very rare. They are identified by the black plumage. They're which are usually and they have a long curved beak which they use probing for inverts as you can see. Yeah. And then another one who's hunting right now is the gray egret or great white egret. It's another large wading bird. And you can kind of tell 
tell the difference between egrets and herons based off their leg colors. Egrets usually with a black leg and herons with like a yellow or like greenish yellow leg. You can see this guy's kind of hunting too. So I have another alligator back on that berm. Probably six footer. So he's on the hunt. He's on the hunt. Very cute. Thank you. Ibis is behind. Blue herons love bullying other birds for food. That's why he was following him. Oh. A slow ash pine and a snag, which is just another word for a dead tree. And they don't take the, like the parks won't take these kinds of things out just because like woodpeckers will use them. And there's just, they're useful to other like birds for our like perching so there's no reason to get rid of them so they just get to be here yeah when it falls down and decays it recycles nutrients into the environment and it also uses a home for the bugs and small animals yeah what we have right here is an osprey or our fish hawk as most people know usually white with like a spotted chest or breast and then like brownish wings uh, they have very curved talons for essentially grasping fish and refusing to let them go. Um, they are Florida's like main raptor species next to like the red shoulder hawk. But they like to perch up on like poles with their fish, which I believe they are eating right now. And just kind of hang out. When we said we'd come back. But it's definitely got that very leathery feel to it, although they're not producing spores as of right now. So here we've got a rosia spoonbill, which is probably one of Florida's rarest birds that you will see. Like other birds, um, they were ex especially extensively hunted due to their plumage, which is a pink color, similar to that of what you might think of as a flamingo. Um, so they're still, I believe, on the endangered species list. Uh, while you can't see it because its head's tucked away, they do have a spoon-shaped bill, and they use that to collect the inverts that are their main prey source. And they're called pink coloration of like a shrimp. Can you see it? Thank you. That rosy. Okay, we have my favorite creature in the Everglades, the Florida soft shell. Named aptly because its shell is not hard like others. And it's got that long tubular nose. Just has to stick that part out to breathe. Because of its soft shell, it's very prone to predation. And it is a carnivore, so it feasts on inverts, fish, and anything it can fit in its mouth, which is, it's a, is a lot, especially when they get to that bigger size. So here we have a pair of model ducks which may be because of the sun and the distance, it's a little hard to see, but they're usually a brown tan color. But that distinctive stripe through their eye is how you know they're mottled ducks. I also have another diving bird, the pied-billed grebe, right there. But they are another of our diving bird species, um, similar to that of the anhinga and cormorant, just exceptionally small in comparison. And they also uh, have little wax in their feathers so that they can dive. Just like you saw how it went under and just zoomed behind all that vegetation back there. All right, well, that is the end of the three quarter mile boardwalk of Wakota Hatchie. If you've got any questions about things you'll see or encounter, or just general questions about this, let us know. Thank you for watching. And if you're out and about in nature, happy identifying.